Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Some crazy news coming from the SEC on October 30th. They released a press uh, release that said that they were charging SolarWinds CISO, Timothy Brown, with fraud and internal control failures relating to allegedly known cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities that came about um, and eventually compromised the company in the SolarGate, SolarWinds um, compromise back in 2020. So the complaint alleges that Brown defrauded investors by overstating SolarWinds cybersecurity practices and understating or failing to disclose known risks. There were some bangers in this press release, so I'm going to put a link (laughs) to it in the show notes because as you read through this, you're like, wow. And also, not far off from what I think a lot of organizations might be doing. So this is a shot across the bow for all cybersecurity shops and cybersecurity leaders to take note of. So the complaint alleges that SolarWinds public statements about its cybersecurity practices and risk were at odds with this, with its internal assessments, including a 2018 presentation prepared by a company engineer shared internally, including with Brown that SolarWinds remote access setup was quote, not very secure and that someone exploiting the vulnerability quote can basically do whatever without detecting it until it's too late, which could lead to major reputation and financial loss for solar winds. Similarly, as alleged in the complaint, 2018 and 2019 presentations by Brown stated respectively that the current state of security leaves us in a very vulnerable state for our critical assets and that access and privilege to critical systems and data is inappropriate. The complaint also alleges that multiple communications among SolarWinds employees, including Brown, throughout 2019 and 2020 questioned the company's ability to protect its critical assets from cyber attacks. And in June 2020, while investigating a cybersecurity attack on a SolarWinds customer, Brown wrote that it was very concerning that the attacker may have been looking to use SolarWinds Orion software in larger attacks because our, quote, back ends are not that resilient. And in September 2020, an internal document shared with Brown and others stated, the volume of security issues being identified over the last month have outstripped the ca- capacity of engineering teams to resolve. Wow. The <laughs> complaint also alleges that Brown was aware of all of these cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities, but failed to resolve them and at times insufficiently raise them to further within the company. So SolarWinds, um, as part of the press release, SolarWinds also made a, an incomplete disclosure about the Sunburst attack on December 14, 2020, the Form 8K filing, which following its stock price drop, approximately 25% over the next two days and approximately 35% by the end of the month. All in all, this final statement on the press release states, rather than address these vulnerabilities, SolarWinds and Brown engaged in a campaign to paint a false picture of the company's cybersecurity controls, thereby depriving investors of accurate material information. Today's enforcement actions not only charges SolarWinds and Brown for misleading the investing public and failing to protect the company's crown jewel assets, but also underscores our message to issuers. Implement strong controls calibrated to your risk environments and level with investors about known concerns. Holy shnikes. Like I said, some bangers in this thing. Definitely go and read it because this these are just some excerpts from it. and. This puts every single cybersecurity leader at a publicly traded company on notice. So if I was in that position, I would highly, 
highly recommend going back and checking what we have implemented and what we are disclosing to the SEC. We were discussing in the pre-show the order of events when I became aware of this and shared it with you or when you became aware of this and shared it with me. Either way, we had the same reaction. And you summarized it really well. The bottom line up front is that for every cybersecurity leader at every publicly traded company, you are on notice. And here's the thing that occurred to me as I read through this, because I worked in enterprise IT before joining Microsoft. And I knew of multiple areas of risk in our cybersecurity posture. And my understanding was the security leadership was well aware of them too. And so every company has more they need to do. No one has hung a banner and said, mission accomplished, we have solved cybersecurity. So I, as much as I'm encouraged by this because I have mused on this show that the risk of stock price dropping and reputational damage and negative impacts from a cybersecurity incident had lessened over time as we had become so accustomed to them that the incentives and negative reinforcement loop had really been diminished with time. And all of a sudden, the Securities and Exchange Commission comes roaring back in and creating a massive negative impact loop to the point of federal charges against security leaders at publicly traded companies if you're not properly solving and disclosing your risk. This is incredible. So I guess, again, the, the one thing I'm torn about, though, is was solar winds really that much more... Um, trying to find the right words here, but worse off than a lot of other companies out there. I talk to enterprise customers all the time and they all have their own warts and flaws in various ways, some larger than others, some deeply concerning. Sometimes I, in my role at Microsoft, get off a call with a customer and my reaction is, I probably don't want to do business with them in my personal life based on their security practices and posture. And I negligent was the word I was looking for. Is SolarWinds really that negligent compared to some of the other customers I've worked with and had have had visibility into? I don't know that they are. So ultimately, I feel like where this really comes down to is like that last line you read from the press release. Our message to issuers, implement strong controls calibrated to your risk environment. And then the last part, probably the most critical, level with investors about known concerns. Because ultimately, if you level with investors and you give them a fair picture of where your posture sits, even if it's not great, that's okay. There's plenty of companies that have lousy operations, lousy outlook, uh, lousy whatever, but at least they're honest about it. Um, like, I don't know if some of these great American retailers circling the drain, like JCPenney is publicly traded anymore, but if they are, I'm sure they're very realistic with investors about, Hey, our business sucks and it's not really getting any better. So I, I don't know if it's really a crime to have poor cybersecurity, but it is a crime to not let investors know an accurate picture of that. And so I think that ultimately is the thing here where you've got to be more upfront and you've got to say, Hey, you know, we're working on it. But at the same time, then here, put my cybersecurity hat on, not my protecting wall street investment firms. Like the more you disclose, the more you become a beacon or a target for attackers. So balancing that act of accurately disclosing your risk and your posture to investors while at the same time not revealing too much to make yourself an attractive target, that is quite the high wire balancing act. I really empathize with CISOs who maybe had some extra sleepless nights this week if your company is publicly traded 
because you are being asked to balance a lot more than ever. This was just shocking to me in so many ways. And you can tell from my scattered braid response that I'm still wrestling with it in a lot of different ways, being pulled in different directions. Yeah. I also am a little bit torn on the fact that the CISO is getting charged unless, you know, I wasn't part of the investigation, internal communication and documentation may all be part of this fraud charge, but oftentimes CISOs actually aren't part of the big boys table as far as the leadership goes. And so he may report to someone else that reports to the CEO. So I don't know where in the chain of command the solar wind CISO is. And oftentimes the business may override CISO decisions on security. So I'm just reading through these notes and I'm thinking, okay, well, there was a 2018 presentation prepared by a company engineer. Like I used to be, you know, a cybersecurity engineer and mm -hmm. I would, find these things and I would elevate them. And then, you know, they'd come back from the business and be like, Nope, you know, we're going to accept the risk. And you're mm -hmm. like, as an engineer, okay, I guess, you know, this is a big deal, but you're going to accept it. And so sometimes the business overrides it. So I'm just curious where the solar wind CISO sits because I'm torn of charging the security officer with it. If they're in fact not, making all the decisions and accepting the risk mm -hmm. for the company. If they're not empowered to, Correct. to do all of it. Yeah. It, uh, that occurred to me too. And it, it's a lot of these quotes that are supposed to be so damning here are like a company engineer. I mean, that could be a junior level engineer fresh out of college, got really excited and started highlighting all of these risks and then emailed it to the CISO and, and like it never got read and okay, maybe the CISO should be reading all their email. I, I don't know. But at the same time, it's like, well, he, they were clearly aware of it. I, it's like, I don't know. I mean, have you ever been in an enterprise before? Like a lot of stuff gets unread. A lot of things get said that, that don't necessarily get followed up on it. And, and I'm not excusing that behavior, but again, it's like, gosh, like federal crimes for this. At, at the end of the day, this will level up cybersecurity. So for the American public and for the investing public, that is a good outcome. But for the people who are responsible for wearing the blue hats and protecting these great companies, uh, your life got a little, little more difficult now. Um, and in some ways, you know what this does? This drives that communication underground because we're going to tell people, well, don't put it in email. Don't put it in writing. You know, if you have concerns, tell me verbally. So there isn't a paper trail. It's going, I, I, I've seen what happens when you give people perverse incentives, they will, they will take it to the other end. And so this does not necessarily promise to bring all this to light. It promises in some ways to maybe sweep this under the rug even more. So there isn't a paper trail. There isn't a document trail of it. Uh, when you do disclose things like that, I could see new policies being erected in publicly traded companies. Again, maybe not written policies, but kind of verbal policies of, Hey, if you find something, you know, just let me know verbally, come, come, come to me and tell me about it. Don't, don't put it in an email. Don't put it in a PowerPoint. I don't know. No. More to come on this. I am sure this is, this is an early days of this new regime. I feel like in this new policy. Yeah, definitely. If there are updates to this, I want to know about it and I'll certainly update our listeners on it as well. Mm -hmm. So the other topic I wanted to talk about, tonight was I got some interesting questions from a customer this week and it prompted a whole lot of talking amongst our internal group that Adam and I are part of and we got to be talking about like business continuity plans and disaster recovery as a part of it but I wanted to throw these questions out here and kind of talk through them as part of the show because I think they're interesting questions um, and maybe these have come across some of the listeners, you know, desk from leadership or maybe yourself, you, you're considering them. So as part of like disaster recovery and business continuity or data recovery, one of the questions that this customer asked was data stored in a team or group for a 2023 20, sales conference 
and that group is deleted and nobody notices that it was deleted for six months. So we're talking about Microsoft Teams here and data stored within that if someone deletes the Teams. And so, you know, in most cases, admins can delete Teams and then owners of the Teams can delete the Teams. Um, the Teams is associated with an M365 group and so if that group is deleted, then the data is deleted as well. There is what's called a soft delete. So once the group is deleted and the data is deleted, there's 30 days to recover that Teams. Once the 30 days are up, it can't be restored. It is permanent dele permanently deleted after that. Now, you can use things like the O365 audit log or the O365 activity alerts to receive emails or Teams messages when an M365 group is deleted. And I'll have links within the show notes to different MVPs that have done this. The activity alerts is native and part of the UI. If you're using the audit log, you have to script it or use some PowerShell in order to pull from the activity log. You can also use Power Automate to do some of this stuff. So there's multiple ways to do it, but either way, you can receive notification when this is done. So in this case, yes, if no one notices for six months, the data is gone, but there are ways to prevent this. If this is a concern, just monitor it using some sort of alert system. Yeah, another thought as well would be retention labels mm -hmm. and, and leveraging those. So there's a, a whole portion uh, of Microsoft 365 dedicated to data lifecycle management, which revolves around things like setting retention labels. And retention labels can do one of two things. They can either A, make sure stuff is deleted after it gets so old, which is desirable because you don't want to keep data around any longer than you have to nowadays and if you get rid of it through a regular process and it's gone then you obviously can't but don't have to produce it for legal proceedings which can reduce uh, some of your risk against you and i am not a lawyer but i do understand that concept the other thing you can do is you can say this must be retained for a certain length of time so we must retain this we have a legal obligation for x number of months or years or whatever. And so if part of the concern around this, maybe not in this specific use case, but in general is, well, we have data that can't be deleted. Well, then you should be using data lifecycle management. You should have retention labels configured and you should have retention labels automatically applied to that content that must be retained for that length of time. All of that tooling exists. It's all there. There's even additional things around records management and, that can even make data immutable if like it, it can just literally never be deleted ever, ever. You can do that as well. So that all exists too. I would say that's adjacent to this conversation, but could be germane to it as well. So another thing to look at if you're talking about data in Microsoft 365 and other services are going to have similar technology as well, because this is a very common use case where we either want to get rid of it after so long, or we must retain it for so long. And that's built into our platform and, and many other competitors' platforms as well. So definitely something to look into there. Andy kind of walked through other ways you can notice the, the potential deletion of it. And also there are lifecycle features built into M365 groups, where if all of the owners leave the company and there's no ownership of it, if no one claims it, it gets deleted after so long. You can do regular attestation as required to keep it alive. We do that at Microsoft, where anyone can create a Microsoft 365 group and by virtue a team anytime you want, but they will come back and ask you, I believe every six months or year, hey, do you still need this? And if you don't respond, it goes poof and disappears as well. So you can configure those to build some rigor around intentionally, again, cleaning up and getting rid of uh, groups and teams that are no longer used as well, which again, might be adjacent to this because I know we're talking about accidental deletion or maybe undesired deletion, but all of those are related subjects because 
if you say, hey, we have built-in cleanup, it runs every so often, you don't need to delete things manually, then that might help you be able to flag stuff in the audit log and investigate it more thoroughly when, say, something's deleted even though it hasn't been alive for a year. Yeah, and when it comes to data protection, you know, the first thing, and this is something that we've talked about all the time in security, is you can't protect something that you don't know exists, which means that you need to do an inventory. You need to understand where your critical assets are. You need to understand where your critical data is. And if there's some sort of, you know, site that you need that has critical data in it that shouldn't be deleted, that should be as part of your inventory and no. And so, you know, either have alerts around it or, um, you know, these retention labels. And that is part of your initial process of discovery of inventorying your data and making sure you know where those critical assets lie. So I think, you know, before you start, and that may be something that's too large to, start to work on. And I think that's where a lot of companies dive into data protection and then it becomes too much for them to, you know, do in one project because it is overwhelming once you start looking at it. Um, But inventorying and understanding where your critical assets is essential to, you know, designing some sort of protections around it. So make sure you know where your critical data is. The next question that the customer had is more of an apocalyptic doomsday scenario. A bad actor seeking revenge against the company gains global administrative access and deletes all of the data, or there is a site-wide corruption. Like in that case, how would we recover all of our data? And that's a pretty grim situation. Um, It is, very, very unlikely that something like that would happen. But ultimately, when I look at this, it's an identity problem first off. But before we start to talk about identity, a site-wide data corruption, when I read that, I'm like thinking, okay, maybe he's thinking from the Microsoft side, there's some data corruption and the data is gone. I don't ever see this happening in my opinion. Adam, maybe you can elaborate on what your thoughts are, but I don't think anything like this would ever happen. And if it did, Microsoft would most likely restore it because we have servers dedicated to all this stuff. And in fact, there's a whole data protection as part of the Microsoft Trust Center, that documentation, a link, and that talks about how your data is protected. But that's kind of the point of having a SaaS solution and having one as big as Microsoft is your data is safe when you trust it with Microsoft. Right. And so I don't see a data corruption ever happening. Or maybe on the flip side, data corruption happens in small doses all the time and it's corrected and dealt with and remediated too. Um, could be could be a little mixture of both right so you linked in the show notes and you'll like our show rundown and you'll put in the show notes microsoft has documentation that walks through a lot of the resilience that's built into the microsoft 365 platform around things like data corruption and how that is dealt with and how data is protected and um, the active active design and and everything else like when you start reading through the protections that are in place for SharePoint online or exchange online, essentially they're designed around the idea that there will be minor corruption occasionally. And here's how we're going to deal with it. And here's how we're going to recover from it and do self healing and move on. So it's one of those things. And and we'll talk through this as we go through this discussion, but I, I have a couple of points. Number one, with anything, cybersecurity, I think you should focus your efforts as much as possible on where they're most likely to bear fruit. Um, And so that's focusing on the most likely attacks, the attacks where you can uh, harden your security with the least effort, those sorts of things. And so once you get way down to, well, what if a asteroid block, you know, 
hits the earth or the heat death of the universe or the sun um, goes supernova. Like, sure, those are all potential risks, but ultimately, what are you going to really do about it? And so if, if Microsoft would have like tenant wide corruption in your tenant to the point where your tenant became unusable and needed to be restored from scratch, um, there's probably bigger problems. Uh, the Microsoft 365 service may be unavailable entirely or, or may have suffered such a catastrophic failure. It may be down for a period of time. Who knows? But once you read through some of the resiliency in place, it's one of those things that's highly unlikely. And if it were to happen, like you said, that is the benefit of the SaaS service. It's the SaaS provider's responsibility to restore that and bring that to an operational state. So anything that's like a data failure on the Microsoft side, not on the customer responsibility side, Microsoft will then resolve. It's not the customer's responsibility to go fix that if there were a data resilience issue on the part Microsoft's responsible for. So whether that's catastrophic hard drive failure, catastrophic uh, data loss, whatever, and it wasn't a customer thing, that's on Microsoft. Now, on the flip side, and what we're going to talk about next are where that data loss happened in the customer responsibility side, and that is a different conversation. So kind of want to clarify here, you've probably seen this before, but there's different responsibility models where in the SaaS model, Microsoft's responsible for this, the customer's responsible for that. And where that data loss were to occur on which side of that responsibility model, that affects how you would recover from it. So something to keep in mind. Yeah, and then the second point was really around like if your global administrator got compromised and then they delete all the data. See, now this is on that customer responsibility side. Right. And ultimately, to me, this is an identity problem, right? Because mm-hmm. if your global administrator credentials are getting compromised, you have bigger problems. There's something that is not secure about your global administrative like access. This should never happen. Your global administrator credentials should never get compromised. There are ways to prevent it today to reduce the risk to almost zero of it ever getting compromised. Number one, use fish-resistant MFA. If you're using fish-resistant MFA on a FIDO2 key, how is that ever going to get compromised? And we're talking from external attackers first. So let's talk about external attackers first because you would have to physically get access to that FIDO2 uh, security key in order to compromise a global administrator if this was part of your conditional access. Second of all, you should have compliant devices configured for a global administrator. It means it must be accessed on a compliant device through Intune. So now I need to get your MFA token, your physical key, as well as the physical device that is compliant to you know, your tenant. And then... You should, if this is like one of your concerns, like, oh, my global administrator might get compromised, and you're thinking about these doomsday scenarios, those two things are low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Should be done 100% today, right now, yesterday. The second thing is if this is such a concern to you, you should be implementing SAWS or PAWS, Secure Access Workstations, Privileged Access Workstations. There's documentation on Microsoft's site, and I can link it in the document. Uh, in the show notes, because I don't have it in our show notes now, but I've seen it. It walks you through exactly how to configure a privileged access workstation for a privileged account access for Azure. It walks you through the entire thing Mm -hmm. step by step. So if this is a concern, do that because it heavily locks down the, the workstation to only access certain things. Like you shouldn't be able to check email on a paw. You shouldn't be able to access Facebook on a paw. Like it's just locked down to do administrative work for Azure. <laughs> and then finally, don't have standing access. Don't have standing access for global administrator. That role is not needed all the time. So you should use privileged identity management, PIM. That does require separate licensing for it, but it is highly recommended and it's an amazing tool to use because you use just-in-time escalation to global administrator 
as well as you could, number one, require additional MFA. When you do that, you can require conditional access for uh, context, and then you can require approval. So let's say I'm trying to escalate to global administrator. It might kick off an approval chain to a team member. It might kick off an approval chain to my manager and say, hey, Andy's trying to escalate to global administrator. What's the reason? What's the work? Where's the ticket number? Right? Like then I can double check the ticket number. Hey, I need to do this. Oh, that does require global administrator. This is a legitimate business purpose. It came from a legitimate request. Okay. And then you can expire that access after a certain period of time. Right. And so these are all protections. If this is a concern, do all those things because if all those things are in place, the risk of your global admin creds getting compromised are nearly zero. This might be the most fired up I've ever seen you on this show. And it's hilarious because this first bubbled up three, four days ago and you're still hot about it. And I love it <laughs> and because it's true, right? As opposed to sitting there stressing about some doomsday scenario, which is highly unlikely, there are likely compromises that you can protect and the effort is small and minimal and easily implemented. Like again, low hanging fruit. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's an overused phrase, but this is the textbook definition of low hanging fruit. And you should have your global administrator accounts hardened to a point where it is nearly impossible to think of a scenario, which an attacker can thread the needle and compromise it. Okay, they may compromise some other administrative account, but get it to the point when this is just not possible um, in, in all practicality. And that is, that is a really achievable state without a lot of work. You even mentioned PIM, Privileged Identity Management. Yes, if you're an M365 E3 customer, you may not own this today. However, if you have less than 100 administrators, and you probably do unless you're an enormous enterprise, we are talking two figures a month. So given the risk versus the benefit, I think that is the most easily justifiable spend in the world. Go get it and get it done. These are, these are really things, like you said, should be done yesterday. Now, we're talking external attackers, right? Right. Pretty hard to do. Now, internal attackers, a lot different because these are people that you have trusted with that access. And maybe you have a disgruntled employee that is current, has these type of access, and gets upset enough that they're going to maliciously do this. Unlikely, again, most IT people, if you ask any IT shop, I guarantee you, if you ask any IT shop, any IT leader, which one of your team members do you think could do this? I guarantee you there's like less than 1% that there's anyone. Because if there was, they would be fired. Like you don't, you don't have people on your team that you think are going to do this. You don't trust people with this type of access, the keys to the kingdom, if you think this is a possibility. Or at least you it, shouldn't, right? That should be a disqualifying attribute. If somebody is so hot-headed or, or loose cannon that they would do this kind of behavior, you don't trust them with that level of access. They, no. they need to be even-keeled, even-minded, all of that. Yep, yep. And it is possible that someone might snap at something. Sure, I, I get it that. happens. But if this is something that you're concerned about, then you should have an insider risk program. We did an entire show on insider risk. You should have that. And it is not just looking at tooling to see malicious behavior, but it's also looking at employee morale, pay, benefits, leadership and management performance. Are you happy with your leader? Do they support you in your day-to-day -day job? Stuff like that because if you're unhappy with your management, if you're unhappy with your pay, these are all things that will tick an employee off to the point of doing some sort of malicious behavior. So and, have one and of those. I'd point out in terms of like likelihood here, if it's someone who's known and would have their digital fingerprints on it, they're at risk for legal consequences. If someone were to take the step of wiping this out entirely, uh, obviously there would be legal action to follow because of the, the damage they would have done to the organization. So yes. um, 
it, it would have to be someone who is literally past that point that they don't care or, or they're um, in such a blind rage that they're not thinking about that. Yep. Okay. So let's say you have all those things. You've done all the things that we've talked about and the worst happens, right? An insider risk, which would probably be the most likely scenario of this happening, or you didn't do your due diligence and your global admin creds get compromised by a malicious actor and they do delete all the things. Today, there are ways to recover Teams, Exchange mailboxes, OneDrive, SharePoint data, and they all can be recovered up to a certain point, like iterations of OneDrive data is default at 500. Same thing with SharePoint. You can set it for longer. We talked about Teams with the 30 days. Exchange mailboxes has some sort of retention as well. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it is tedious because you're recovering piece by piece. And when you're talking about a tenant-wide deletion of M365 data, that's going to take a long time to do with the tooling that we have today. However, back in July... At Inspire, there was a new solution that was announced called M365 Backup and Archive. I just wanted to touch on it real quick as part of this conversation where it allows you the capability to backup or archive your SharePoint, OneDrive, and Exchange data. Teams wasn't mentioned in here. I'm assuming because Teams is kind of built on the back end of SharePoint as well as OneDrive and Exchange. If you didn't know that, every single Teams message that you send, like a DM, is technically part of Exchange. It's like a mini email. And then all the files that you upload in DMs are part of your OneDrive. And then on the back end of like the channels and messages, those are all ex Exchange and SharePoint as well. So it's all built on the same technology. So I assume that Teams would be part of this, although it wasn't explicitly pointed out. I just wanted to call that. But public preview is happening very soon. You can go sign up for it still. The backup portion of it is in hot storage tiers and the archive portion of it is in cold storage tiers and they'll all be part of the admin portal you'll be able to restore files you can search through files you can um, keep full uh, e-discovery access policy sensitivity labels all that stuff as part of the backup and archive when i was on an engineering call about this the backup was more as part of like if you wanted it as part of an attack, like ransomware, that was more the idea behind the M365 backup. And the archive was more for long-term storage, legal purposes, data retention, and keeping it in a place where it's a lot cheaper in the cold storage and having to restore it from there. So this is a new capability. We'll have documentation in the show notes to kind of go through it. It's very, very new. And again, it hasn't even launched in public preview the, the link is going to be in the show notes to sign up for it if you're interested in it. And this is coming. I know customers have asked about it for a very long time. They've gone to third parties to like, you know, if this is something you're concerned with, there are third parties that can do this type of backup today, but it's going to be natively built into M365. And the beauty of this is it's talking about mass restoration of data, like large volumes of data. So in this case, this would be the thing to restore it back if this was the attack on you. I didn't know this was a thing. This is really awesome. And the third parties have been out in force lately. And I think for the most part, you know, as I've talked to some of them, I was concerned they would come at it from a FUD angle. And they really do not like the rubrics of the world. They do a very nice job of explaining what Microsoft does offer today, how their product is differentiated, what they can do. The thing that has always concerned me, and I am speaking from a state of pure ignorance here, other than knowing how stuff works, is the ability to restore something from outside the M365 service back into it probably revolves around a lot of API calls. And again, you're going to hit limits on API limits, bandwidth limits, everything else. It would probably just take time and quite a bit of it, period. And then I wonder how full fidelity that backup would really be. 
is everything restored? All of the metadata, all of the R back, is everything just as it was before or not? And my suspicion is it would be hard to do that in a full fidelity way as well. So I don't know if any of that is true or not. But what I do know is working natively with the same service provider in the same cloud, you have a much better chance of having it be quicker and full fidelity. So this is really cool uh, that this is starting to roll out. And so for customers that do have those concerns, uh, now there's an there's a tool for them, there's an option for them uh, to have that peace of mind that if they were to need to do wholesale recovery, tenant-wide recovery, it's built in, um, not built in, but it's available from Microsoft and it's built on the same platform, I should say, um, and in the same environment. So this is really uh, interesting and sounds like coming to public preview soon. So more to come. Yes. And I'm glad you mentioned partners because there is an entire section that's actually dedicated to partners. We're extending our APIs so that the partners can integrate this specific backup and archive capability into their solutions. Cause today they probably use something else to try to back up that. And like you said, it might not be full fidelity. It might involves other ways of getting it, but this is going to be extending the API specifically for the backup and archiving capabilities into say the rubrics of the world, the Veritas and whatnot. So that's really cool. I'm, I'm excited to hear that because now, one of my favorite phrases is that a rising tide lifts all ships. So not only is Microsoft building this native solution, but they're extending the capability to third parties so their solutions get better as well. Microsoft has a, a long history of really working well with partners and relying on partners to enhance their ecosystem. And so this is, this is the right move for all involved because there are customers today who already are working with the rubrics of the world and have their data stored in their solution. And I've always been concerned about the ability to do clean restoration of that. And this only is going to make that restoration experience better, faster, more seamless, more full fidelity moving forward. And that's a win for customers who've already have that relationship or already have done that work uh, uh, with another provider. So everyone is getting uh, better tools to restore their M365 environment in the future, which just really speaks to maturity of the platform over time. Yeah, and obviously we mostly just talked about M365 today, but in a business continuity plan, DR plan, you're obviously looking at other things, right? You're going to be looking at your virtualization, VMs in Azure, AWS, VMware, and all those are, uh, also have different types of backup solutions that are associated with it. So while M365 is great and we have capabilities coming out today, the overall larger conversation about BCPs and DRs, you know, you're going to want to have a larger conversation on the overall capabilities, obviously. So um, this is just a very small portion of it, but I thought it was re really interesting with these questions and obviously... <laughs> I was pretty fired up about the identity part because I just think that makes it a a moot point, essentially, if you're talking about getting your m 3 cc 5 you know, global administrator compromised. That's something that, in my world, should never happen. So um, I think overall, great conversation. We're going to put a lot of stuff in the show notes for you to go over. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want to talk about in the future. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening this week. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.